extraordinary privilege. The privilege to look at your genome and try to answer medical questions for you. I want to share with you over the next 14 minutes my passion for my work, my respect for the genome, and my excitement about the technologies that are now available and that are coming. But before we start, I want to do a little show and tell. Oh, curiosity. <laughs> this is a genome. Oh, just, yeah, it's my yeah, genome. All 46 chromosomes and 6 billion base pairs of me extracted from a single white blood cell. One of the more profound moments in my life was looking through a microscope at my own genomic material. I mean, there I am, every instruction passed to me from my parents and my ancestors, waiting to play out their roles in my personality, my growth, my appearance, and, and my health. I'm fascinated by the genome. And I know you can't tell a lot about this, but I'm going to show you a few of the things that I see as a cytogeneticist. First, I see 46 chromosomes, and that's important. An extra chromosome can have dramatic health events. Um, for example, an extra chromosome 21 will produce a diagnosis of Down syndrome, which I'm sure you're familiar with. The other thing I see is I have two X chromosomes. Whoops, I'm a girl. In, a, in addition to counting the chromosomes, we spend a lot of time through the microscope looking at these little banding patterns and asking, are any bits and pieces of genomic material missing or duplicated? And why would we care? What's in these chromosomes? So this is just a schematic to help ground you to what, to what I see. So this is, this is a, um, a chromosome, unwound. And what it really is is a string of DNA packaged really tightly. And what's DNA? I know you've heard the term. But it's really just a long strand of four alternating nucleotides. When you hear about the sequence of life or the code of life, it's this code, G, A, T, and C, repeated billions of times in your genome. And about 1 to 2 percent of the DNA encodes genes. Those genes direct the production of nearly every component of your body, the skin pigments, the hair pigments, eye pigments, the enzymes that might metabolize your drugs fast or slow, the hormones that might affect your mood or your growth, everything about you almost, is, is directed by genes. And so when I'm looking at chromosomes, if I'm seeing a piece missing, that translates to hundreds of genes that that individual lacks, and that typically has a dramatic health outcome. So who in the audience is aware that they harbor a genetic mutation? I don't see very many hands. This word often has a fairly negative connotation, and I want to spend a minute destigmatizing it. The word mutation, it simply means change. While my genome might be 99.5% identical to any other human being on the planet, that half a percent translates to literally millions of changes in your DNA sequence and structure compared to another human being. Those changes can affect almost nothing. They can be barely observable or, or something benign, or they can have dramatic health consequences. We were all dealt a genetic hand of cards at birth. We inherited many potentially harmful mutations from each of our parents. And by the way, we're given a few new ones. Evolution demands it. We're a changing, evolving species. Every one of us got about 60 extras just to be born. And it doesn't end there. You accumulate muta mutations with every cell division. It eventually will lead to your body's aging and cancer if given enough time or the right genes mutated. So why not avoid those things that accelerate the mutation rate, like carcinogens and sunlight? Because it, it speeds things up. So if I gave you a chance to look at your hand of cards, your mutational burden that affects everything about your body, would you take it? I want you to sit with that question for a few minutes, and we'll revisit it at the end of the talk. So this is what a, a family, a large family with a genetic mutation looks like. The individual with the red arrow is me. This is my family. My grandfather died from a muscular dystrophy several years ago, as have several members of my family. All of my loved ones with a question mark have a very significant risk of inheriting a mutation for an incurable, untreatable, fatal disease. I have a 25% risk, as do my siblings and first cousins, and our parents a 50% risk. It might surprise you to know that while I and my husband do this type of testing in our laboratory, I've never been tested. It's not important to me to know my fate. There is no treatment, and there's nothing that can be done about it. I suppose I could start planning for my eventual disability, um, and some of you would want that information. And for those of you who want that information, we have a test for you and we're happy to offer it. What brings us peace is different, and the kinds of information that are, in, improve our quality of life is different. And I show you this not to get sympathy. I don't actually think I have it. My mom's about to outlive her risk. It's, and, and, and of all the genetic disorders, this is not the worst thing you could have. I show it to you to actually tell you we're one of the lucky families. 
We know the gene, we know the mutation. Any of my loved ones could choose to have a test. There are hordes of researchers working on therapies and cures. But many families aren't that lucky. The goal of a genetics evaluation, and, and this is done in a large team, and I work with an amazing team here at Mission Health. You're seen by a physician and counselors who look at your physical characteristics, your medical history, and your family history in hopes of identifying a genetic basis for your problem. And if there's a test to order, they'll order the test to give you a definitive diagnosis. In 1993, there were only about 100 genetic conditions for which we could test. Last year, we had 2,500 different conditions to test for. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2003. This was a monumental effort. It took us 13 years and $3 billion, but we did it. We hold the, the, human sequence, uh, the human genome sequence in our hands, and that knowledge has accelerated our understanding of the genetic basis of disease and contributed dr dramatically to our ability to test and provide information and to research these conditions. But what about the families without a diagnosis, without a test? Imagine you have a child born with a severe disability or a life-threatening congenital defect. Imagine the questions you would have and need answers for. My sister has two beautiful children with autism. She's desperate for answers. She's desperate to understand where her children fall on the autism spectrum and what she can expect in the future because it's a tremendously large diagnosis. But we don't have a test for her. We don't have an answer, and I'm desperate to give her one. I want to um, share with you the story of one of my first families when I was in training. This was a couple with a child with a severe developmental defect. This child never learned to walk, never learned to talk or to eat. They were seen for 17 years in various genetic clinics, and we didn't have a specific test to offer them. And the only whole genome evaluation we had was the chromosome analysis that I showed you at the beginning. This has been available since the 60s and in wide use since the 70s. And I still perform this test in my laboratory every day. But it has limitations. When you look at a karyotype, you have to be able to visually appreciate a defect in the DNA. You, and, and to give you some perspective, there are about 800 bits of information that we can derive from this study. And despite our best efforts, or the, the field's best efforts, no answer could be given to that family. But I met them um, when a new technology was available, and the technology is not really the point. The point is the answer. We had molecular probes that could, could specifically stay in regions of the chromosome and ask questions that were too small to see with the naked eye through the microscope, which I guess is not the naked eye, but whatever. What we found was that one of his chromosomes was missing a signal. So he was missing a very small end of one of his chromosomes. We tested the parents, as we typically do in genetics, and we were able to tell them that they had no significant risk of recurrence, that this was an unfortunate but new mutation in their child, and they, they should be able to have more children without the fear of recurrence. And as I walked in the room to have that counseling session, and I saw the ages of those parents with the 17-year-old child, I knew immediately that that answer for them came too late. They were certainly grateful. Their search was over. They understood what had happened. But they were past their childbearing ages, and they desperately wanted more children when they were younger. And so what I think of this family a lot, and what it reminds me is that these families don't have the luxury of patience. They can't wait for answers. And if I have a technology available to me that can give answers faster, it is my obligation to employ it and to harness its, its, its power. So what if instead of just probing a few regions of the chromosome, we looked everywhere? So in the mid-2000s, about the time that I joined the team at Mission, a new technology was available, where these um, probes, and again, the technology doesn't matter, it's the answers that matter. But here's the slide surface of this tiny chip, and this has transformed my career and my ability to give answers to the families here at Mission. So our, recall I said 800 bits of information with a karyotype, or the, the chromosome analysis? 2.7 million bits of information across the genome. Every gene that we have is on this chip. And this chip, the, the creation of it, was made available directly as a result of the Human Genome Project. We knew the sequence of the human genome, and we could place it on a chip and ask questions about it. So what do we find? We find a lot of great things. The success stories are the causative mutations. We look, and we find an answer for the child's disability or congenital heart defect. And I should say, I'm spending most of the time talking about children and families, because that's where I spend the, most, the majority of time on my work. But this is true of cancer and adult onset conditions as well. But I'm, I'm going to focus on the children. So let me give you one example of a, of a success story. This is the, what the data looks like coming off the instrument. And I don't expect you to, to understand um, what I'm looking at, except that we're zoomed way in to just a few genes. We have about 20,000. And here are just a handful of genes at the bottom. And remember, the genes are that long sequence of, of nucleotides. 
And what we see are some probes that have a decreased signal. So what that tells us is that that gene is missing, um, is not present, or at least a piece of that gene is not present. We know that that gene causes intellectual disability and developmental delay. So this diagnosis provides the physicians and medical care providers with immediate access to literature that explains the patient's presentation, provides the family with access to other families with a similar disability, and an understanding of what is happening with this child, and potentially access to treatments and research protocols for, for understanding the condition. We see other things too. We see mutations we don't understand. And this is actually the scary part, at least for most medical care providers, because we don't appreciate uncertainty in medicine. It's uncomfortable. We don't like to tell families that we don't understand what we see. But it's just the byproduct. Our technology has outpaced our understanding of medicine. The, the, the understanding isn't there. About half of the genes in our genome, we don't even know what they do. Do they make an olfactory receptor that affects your sense of smell, or do they affect uh, a structural component of bone? We still don't know. So sometimes I see something I don't understand. But I, I'm okay with that, because what I know is that I promise those families, and the clinicians I work with promise those families that we'll continue to look, and we will eventually understand it. We document it, we network with as many labs as possible, and we try to accelerate our understanding. Rather than waiting on the researchers to catch up with us, we put the information out there, de-identify it. We don't share parent, uh, patient information, but we can share our experience with this mutation and the types of findings we saw in the patient. We created a database, and this is a direct result of my um, profound impatience, which works really well in my career, not so well in my marriage and personal relationships. But I couldn't stand it. You see a mutation, and you might only see it one time in your entire career. And how much of an expert can I be if I've only seen it once and there's not a single publication I can read to educate myself about it? But it's there. It's in this patient. It's not in anyone else in the world. Is it the cause of their disability, or is it something terribly uninteresting? So we made a database to deposit these findings and to network with labs all over the world. The Mission Healthcare Foundation supports this as a nonprofit initiative. And it is allowing us to provide more expert diagnosis and families more answers more quickly. We also find mutations that were unexpected. Um, these are also troubling, and, and it's part of the reason a whole genome exploration is difficult and something I want to spend the last part of my talk sharing with you. Sometimes these mutations, um, while they're not explaining what we went in to look for, let's say we're looking for the cause of developmental delay, we might find a mutation that almost guarantees that that child is going to get colon cancer at some point in their adult life. Of course we share that information. It's relevant for that patient as well as potentially other family members and could possibly save their life with early detection. There's really no question as to whether that information should be shared, but it's not always that straightforward. So imagine a child a three-year-old with a congenital heart defect, and they're sent to our laboratory for a genome exploration to explain the heart defect. Maybe we don't find a cause for the heart defect, or maybe we do, but what we also find is a deletion on the Y chromosome in that male little boy that will virtually guarantee he will never produce sperm and he will have an infertile course as an adult. Now, what's the right answer? Is, is the answer to tell this family or not to tell? And, and I should say that the right not to know is a term we use a lot in our field Geneticists and ethicists feel very strongly that if you have a genetic test, you should be informed of what is tested, what might be found, and you should have the option whether or not you want to receive that information. As illustrated by my family story, I've elected not to be told of my genetic risk for myotonic muscular dystrophy, and that's fine. We, we actually embrace that right and, 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 and support it. But in this case, do you tell the child that he's going to be infertile and then expect him to have a, a psychological outcome from that? What if he doesn't enjoy the same relationships? He meets a woman, but he's afraid to enter into a relationship because she wants children. Or what if we don't tell him, and as an adult, after years of emotionally painful infertility and expensive treatments, he, could, he found out that he could have known this answer all along. There's no one right answer that's right for everyone because people have different approaches to this type of information. Whole genome testing um, is very difficult for informed consent. We do our best to educate our families. We let them know the types of information that we can find, but sometimes we find things that we were not expecting. And I can stand here as a medical professional that does little else than think about the genome all day long and tell you that I could not possibly provide an adequate informed consent for a whole genome exploration. We do our very best. I think it's worth it. I think it's worth those risks because we can give answers, but it's something to really take seriously. So I'm going to end my talk with a question. 
So what if instead of 2.7 million bits, what if we could sequence all of the bases, all of the billions of sequences in our genome? Whole genome sequencing was thought to be a pipe dream for a long time. It was much too expensive and much too cumbersome, but it's here. It's in medicine today. It's just making its way here. It's certainly not cheap enough for routine clinical care, but it will be, and I'm ready. I'm excited for the answers that I'm going to be able to give patients and families. But what about seemingly healthy people? I told you earlier about your genetic hand of cards and asked whether you would want to take a look. If someone asked you to sequence your genome, would you say yes? Well, I've been asked to sequence my genome. They like to have medical genetics, uh, the, the people that in, in, invented the technology appreciate genetics professionals taking an early look at this. I declined. I'm not that interested in myself. I think I'm kind of boring, and frankly, I'm a little bit afraid of what I might find. As you can tell, I'm fairly conservative. Even though I do testing, I don't really want to test myself. But I've thought about that decision a lot, and, and especially when I was preparing this talk, and I've reconsidered. I've decided that while I'm still afraid of what I might find, the con contribution to general knowledge is more important. And I also think I'm going to be a more empathetic and careful provider of care if I walk in those shoes before I ask it of our patients. So in April, I plan to walk through that door. And again, I'm a little bit afraid, but I'm also a little bit excited. And I want to leave you with this. If you are asked, because I'm not asking you to do it, I'm not even sure you should, but I know you'll be asked. It'll be cheap enough. You can spend $100 and send it, your saliva off to some company. Please just take it seriously. Seek counseling from a medical professional and educate yourself as to the types of information you might receive. It's your genome. Respect it. Own it. Thank you.